Hello and welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Toronto. I'm Marshall Seckliff in the booth with Frank Karsten. Got a nice one here, Frank. We've got Chris Pakula playing WW. That's White Weenie. Uh, so I'm assuming we're talking about the mono white version as we see a Dragon Hunter hit the battlefield on turn one here for Chris. He's playing against Magnus Lanto, who's on Bant Company. Yes, but indeed. But not, not the normal version necessarily, right, Frank? No, this is a list with uh, some, some tweaks, some spicy cards in there. So instead of uh, Bounding Crazes and some other cards, uh, Magnus Lanto, as well as some other members of uh, Eureka, are playing Band Company with Eldrazi Sky Spawner. You know, just accelerates, uh, gets a flyer, Eldrazi Displacer, and Archangel Evacyn, some more copies than, uh, than usual. Possibly setting up some, some sweet interactions. Chris Picula, in the meantime, is playing the white weenie list with uh, as many as 21 drops. So a creature on turn one and then two creatures on turn two is not a surprise. It is actually what the deck is designed to, uh, mm. to put out. It's now, super how aggressive. How about this Eldrazi Sky Spawner here? Putting out two one, at least one powered creature, so a 2-1 and a 1-1 one, one, to tussle with Chris Pakula's board. Could it be kind of interesting, the Anointer of Champions perhaps throwing a, a monkey wrench into that play. Indeed. If it weren't for the Anointer of Champions, uh, the Eldrazi Sky Spawner would be providing a 2 for 1 here, allowing Magnus to claw back into, into the game against this uh, onslaught of cheap white creatures, oh many no. with, with one toughness. How do you feel about always watching? Uh, I hate that feeling when someone is watching me. <laughs> <and> <laughs> <laughs> I think Magnus is going to learn to dislike it, depending on what Chris does here. Pakula sitting at 6-0. and You may recognize his name from his appearance on Enter the Battlefield recently, the awesome magic documentary that came out last week. Also, I mean, you know, for those that have been playing for a long time, we'll know Chris for sure, just because he's a long-established magic pro. But if you're a little newer to the game, yes, this is that same Chris Pakula. He's trying to get on the Hall of Fame. He's currently not eligible for voting. They upped the threshold, and he's going to need to pick up a bunch of pro points in order to uh, put himself back in the conversation. Now, meanwhile, Magnus Lanto is the reigning Magic Online champion. Certainly relevant with the Magic Online championships coming up uh, soon. So definitely a match between two experienced players. Chris decided that uh, this Anointer of Champions, it can trade for an Eldrazi Sky Spawner, which... Eh. Well, things get really interesting now, though, don't they, Frank? Because I think that Chris was trying to set up for always watching here, and that's exactly what he's going to do. But, you know, Magnus is certainly representing a collected company here. Mm -hmm. Chris has no care at all, but there it is, collected company. Let's see what he hits. It's a pretty big sequence here. Ooh, already two Reflector Mages in hand for Lanto. Wow! That is Watch not this. bad. So I wonder whether Magnus is doing this uh, before uh, Chris has a chance to declare attackers. I would guess so, because then if you hit a Bounding Crisis uh, you can I, still tap it, but actually Magnus, I, I Magnus think is Chris playing attacked. Bounding Crisis. So yeah, and, and cr I saw, remember they all have uh, vigilance, and I saw Chris, you know, kind mm -hmm. of do the, what do you call that, the vigilance push, you know, the I am attacking with this, even though it's not tapping thing. <laughs> yep. And then it does mean that uh, all the creatures were attacking, which meant that Anointer of Champions, which, which can pump an attacking creature, was able to pump, in this case, the Talia's Lieutenant before, uh, well, before it got bounced back into uh, Chris's hand. So this is going to leave Lanto with an interesting decision on whether to double block the Lieutenant, which he does, yeah, that, that is definitely a fine trade. Just a 2-3 Reflector Mage for Italia's Lieutenant that would threaten to grow out of hand. What a savage enough. blowout that was. That was huge, right? Hey, Collected Company is so powerful. God. It, 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 it is in this deck for a reason. It gave Magnus both some card advantage, you know, two for one, but also mana advantage uh, in the sense that you got six mana worth of creatures out of a four mana instant. It is quite the swing. I mean, didn't it kind of just win him this game? Hey, the game is not uh, not over yet. Is it not over yet? Uh, well, I mean... Are you sure it's not over yet, Frank? 
Magnus is the, the control uh, mm -hmm. player, has the control role in this matchup, mm -hmm. because Chris's deck is so low to the ground, and if the game goes into a long game, then Magnus is favored. Mm -hmm. But Magnus does not have a dominating board position yet. Okay. Uh, is at a single digit life total, whereas Chris has a handful of creatures, always watching on the battlefield. It is possible that Chris can set up some uh, some good attacks over the course of the next few turns. Okay. I'm just looking at it like this. So Magnus is going to have reasonable blocks here. And then he's going to get to transform Jace. Then he gets to play another collected company. And I just, mm -hmm. you know, I could see this spiraling out of control pretty quickly. Remember, Chris has two creatures in his can't hand, at least, that he just can't even cast this turn, right? That is true. But he also has plenty of other creatures ah. that he can, uh, can play. Or now the plot thickens. Yeah, you know, take out the J, so that takes out the possibility for Magnus to flashback that collected company. Okay. Expedition, on, uh, Expedition Envoy there for Pakula. Magnus feels comfortable enough to attack. Let's see why. Okay, good start, Nissa. And once you get to the mid to late game, the band company deck will rarely run out of gas. Mm. And all these creatures that provide some kind of advantage, ranging from Tireless Tracker to Nissa, are responsible uh, for that. Wow, yeah, he is just spewing creatures on the battlefield here is Lanto. So Lanto is definitely ahead in this game. Okay. But now Chris has the chance to replay some of his creatures. He also has uh, Anointer of Champions to go with uh, Anafensa here. So he can, he can start to build a board with pretty big creatures. At the moment, Magnus has a bunch of 2-1s and 1-1s on the battlefield, whereas Chris's creatures threaten to grow bigger. And right now, too. Mm -hmm. Expedition Envoy is crunching in there. Oh, this is getting interesting. I mean, this looks like he may just be... Oh, he's going to double block. Make the trade here. Yeah, when Magnus is at 8 life, he cannot really take 3 damage. Uh, uh, well, uh, turn after turn, so he kind of has to trade here. Or jump block, but well, might as well trade. Okay, he's going to transform Nissa. And are we going to see him go for card advantage or making a 4-4? Four, four? He's going to make a 4-4. Four, four. He, nice he can already draw a card with uh, the clue. Possibly mm -hmm. ensuring that he has a play on this turn. And hey, the 4-4 four, four is a pretty big blocker at this point. Ooh, did he draw? Is that uh, Avison? I think so. Is that what you saw too, Frank? Yes. That's Look at that. Mana just things around. beautifully set up here. <laughs> Five mana. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that could be the one. Let's find out, though. Chris Pakula is not done yet. So what we might see here, a play that Magnus uh, potentially has access to, is well, Archangel Avacyn coming down to probably eat the Traben Gossip Monger in combat. And then afterwards, Magnus can sacrifice the Eldrazi Sion that he got from the, from the Sky Spawner. The Sion? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and then transform Avacyn Dear in God. his upkeep, still keep his 4-4, uh, four four, as well as a huge Archangel Avacyn while possibly sweeping Chris's uh, entire board, especially if that uh, Trebin Gossip Monger dies in combat. The town Gossip Monger? The, the town Gossip Monger. Yeah, sure. I mean, I know what town yeah, yeah, he's yeah. from, too. <laughs> he, he's he must definitely be. from Thraben. Yeah, see? Uh, <laughs> or Thrabe. All right, there we go. Archangel Avacyn, and Pakula just has to kind of sit back, because this has not gone well for him. Remember the... Collected Company hit two Reflector Mages, which was pretty ideal there. And now he's got to deal with Archangel Avacyn. Yeah, this is, uh, this is tough. A transformation into some uh, incited rebel is not going to help. There's more than enough power lined up to take it down. Yeah, and you know what? Pakula's going to just go ahead and pack it in here. He's seen enough. You know, I, I admire, you know, he, he did start to fight back a bit there uh, from that collected company, which was already a major setback, but the A Archangel Avacyn really kind of put the nails in the coffin there for him. Yeah, first the Nissa, then the Archangel Avacyn. Yeah. Uh, at, before that, the game could have potentially gone either way, although Magnus mm -hmm. was still favored. Mm -hmm. But when Magnus had those two powerful late game cards to take over, 
uh, yeah, that was just enough. All right, so let's go to sideboarding here. Now, one of the things, you know, Frank, that, that occurs to me when I think about building a monocolored deck is actually the sideboard, right? Uh, you end mm -hmm. up losing a lot of flexibility by being monocolored. You know, you trade it in for that consistency, that low curve. D does Chris give up quite a bit here in his board? Uh, yes, well, first up, he has uh, a couple of planes in his sideboard. <laughs> what are those which, there for? Which I don't hate, actually. Okay. I, uh, I like having lands in my sideboard in order to uh, transform into a slightly different deck with, with a higher curve. Okay. Even if I'm playing a three-color deck, I don't mind having a land or po possibly even two in my sideboard. Now I but see he's got uh, three Gideons here, which, yep. you know, uh, that's a little bit of a higher curve for mm -hmm. him there. I don't think he wants those in this matchup. Those mm. are more meant against decks with uh, language or something like that. But it's it's nice to have access to it. But yeah, uh, his sideboard does not contain a lot of cards that he will be uh, interested in. He has Handwar Militia Captain. Yeah. Which which actually could be okay if uh, the game gets to a board stall. It's not like the band company deck is filled with uh, removal spells. So uh, so is this one you'd expect to see? Chris bring in the Handware Militia Captain in? Like, is this the matchup that that card's for? Mm. Like, where, where your opponent isn't necessarily killing your creatures? It makes sense. You definitely don't want it against uh, decks with sweepers or something like that. Sure. You want it for the creature mirrors. That would make sense to me. Yeah, that makes sense to me, too. Uh, so Chris also has some additional copies of Griff's Boon in his sideboard, which would be good in order to break through a creature stall but also kind of weak against the uh, Reflector Mage, and they don't really do all that much. Um, okay. Apart from that, Chris probably just wants to keep his, uh, his main game plan consistently, keep the mana curve, all the cheap creatures, keep always watching and Thalia's lieutenant to, uh, to pump them, and then, well, hope that his uh, curve and pump spells get there. Magnus, in the meantime, is probably also not going to change all that much. Uh, I see two copies of Lampold Pacifist in a sideboard. That could be a powerful blocker, 3-3 three, three on turn 2, mm -hmm. against a deck filled with 2-1, so oh, yeah. that could match up well. Uh, I see two copies of Tragic Arrogance. Oh, yeah. That could be fine against a deck that floods the board with so many creatures as the White Weenie deck does. Is it is it too slow? It's a little slow. Um, Probably still worth it, though. But, uh, yeah, I, I think I would still bring it in in this... Uh, in this matchup. Once again, it's one of those cards that excels against decks that try to flood the board with permanence of one type, in this case, creatures. Mm. So, if you have it in the board, it kind of makes sense to put it in. Okay. Alright, looks like we're all set for game number two here. Magnus finds himself up again. Both of these players are sitting at 6-0. and Oh, Chris is going to be on the play here. His hand looks fine. Good combination between lands and spells. I see two planes, five, uh, well, non-land cards. That's perfect. And, of course, a one-drop on turn one. Something would have to go really badly for the white weenie deck not to have a one-drop on turn one. Ah, an Anafenza. Well, if Magnus does not find an answer for that creature... Chris could uh, beef up his entire board quite rapidly. And Magnus does not seem to have the fastest hand. Of course, his deck is not filled with as many early drops as, uh, as Chris's. It's a nice but one, though. But the turn to Sylvan Advocate is... Not the best case scenario for him, right? It, it is what you want to have on turn two. Yeah, it's like his when best blocker. Yeah, when, when you're on, on the draw especially, you really need to get on board early and quickly. So that Zilvan Advocate is huge for Magnus Lanto. Lampold Pacifist might oh. even have been better, but yeah, close enough. Pakula, if he's just going to play a creature, he's going to have to attack with that rabble first and, and make sure it actually gets through, right? You know, by leaving up the pump. Yeah, yep. it looks like he's figured that out. He was going to play a creature pre-combat, but... Yeah, if you tap the mana, then Magnus can easily block his 2-3 on the other 2-3. Right, and he can't use the trigger from on offense to put it on the mm -hmm. rabble either. So, wow, pair of Dragon Hunters here, and P Chris Bakula, geez, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 power here? Yeah, it's a Oof. lot. Of Turn 3? 
It's also huge to turn your Dragon Hunters from 2-1s into 3-2 so that they can rumble with the Sylvan Advocate. Oh yeah, great point. It matters a lot. So yeah, Magnus is behind here. He could cast Reflector Mage on this turn. In order to... Yeah, what would he even bounce in that case? When, when Ana Fenza is on the other side of the board, any creature that you bounce, you're, you're not even all that happy with because it's just going to come back for another trigger. Yeah, for sure. Maybe you just want to bounce Ana Fenza. They're also so cheap. But on the other hand, the Ana Fenza is so easily blocked by both two trees that, yeah, you, are n you don't really mind having it on the battlefield. This is an interesting position now because Chris forced to attack with the rabble here. No, that's interesting too. Thalia's lieutenant is pretty nice. Uh, unfortunately for him, on offense, is not a human. I think she's the ghost of a human. Perhaps. Yeah, Max doesn't have great blocks. If he wants to block, he pretty much has to double block something because both of the attacking creatures have at least three toughness. Still isn't too bad for Magnus, right? Gets rid of the incited rabble on a straight one-for-one -one trade with his Sylvan Advocate. Mm -hmm. Now, what about big picture style here? Ooh, is there an untapped land in hand for Lanto? Because he just drew a collected company. No, it's an Evolving Wilds. Yeah, but a, a big Eldrazi Displacer can help block. Yeah, with Yavamaya Coast to activate it, the Eldrazi Displacer Reflector Mage combo could do some work here. Okay. Okay, I'm interested. I'm picking up what you're putting down, Dr. Frank. I want to see what happens here. This is a good close game. Remember, all of this is with Pakula on two lands, too. Uh, Pekula has, I believe, stays a snare and always watching in hand. So once he even hits the third land, oh. uh, he can uh, put out some powerful enchantments. Oh, speaking of a powerful enchantment, here's a Griff Spoon to help Pekula get in for more damage. And he's fine trading off his ground creatures for an Eldrazi Displacer if that's what Lanto wants to do. So in they go. Yeah, Chris will be happy to trade his creatures for Eldrazi Displacer because Eldrazi Displacer threatens to blink the creature that is uh, currently being attached by Griff's Boon, mm. thereby taking out uh, that possibility. But with Max is already at 14 life, he pretty much has to make a block here in order to protect his life total. Also, getting rid of the Talia's Lieutenant, which threatens to become even bigger in subsequent turns, is probably worth it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It also makes sense for Chris to put the Griff's Boon on the unoffensive because... A, it couldn't attack profitably before, and B, mm -hmm. like you said, if it were to get blinked, let's say that Magnus were to try to set up that type of scenario, well, he would lose the Griff Spoon off of it, but he's not losing all those counters that you see on the other creatures, so he gets to maintain those as well. Yep. So well thought out there by Pakula, and he's knocked Magnus Lanto down to six, but this is a big one. Magnus has collected company in hand, which could always get some sweet cards, but oh he also God. has Tragic Arrogance. And Archangel Avacyn. All right. Oof. Yes. All right, well, let's see what Chris comes up with here. Right? Well, if, if you're a Chris, you have to be wary of a lot of cards here, and that is always the, the tough part about playing against Band Company. Totally. Chris doesn't know what Magnus has in hand. Could be Collected Company, could be Archangel Avacyn, not Remoka's Command, Bounding Graces, Ojitai's Command, so many flash cards in the deck. Um, or perhaps multiples. As yeah. Now, well, another thing that's going to weigh on Chris's decision here is the fact that he is one mana away from having an answer to, like, at least an Anafenza, or excuse me, uh, an Avacyn or something like that. He's got that Stasis Snare in his hand. Mm -hmm. At the same time, his so deck is only playing 18 lands, so you can't really bank on drawing a land on the next turn. Sure. Ooh, another Griff Spoon, though. All right. Go to attacks. And in comes the team. And there's Archangel Avacyn with the trigger. So this is going to create two awesome blockers for Magnus. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Chris, he's going to take three, though. For Magnus, but 
Uh, even even then, this is not all that bad for Chris. Yeah, he's not losing the Dragon Hunter that was blocked by Reflector Mage. Yeah, sure, he loses one creature, but Max is now down to four life. Hmm. And if Chris draws a land for the Stasis Snare to uh, take out Archangel Avacyn, then that Anafensa can keep on attacking as well. Besides, Chris had to do something if he just tries to play around Archangel Avacyn by not attacking or something. Ugh. There's it's tragic not arrogance. Anywhere either. So what is he going to leave him with that Dragon Hunter, which is going to die to an Avacyn transformation? Yep. This is quite the swing. Wow. Savage. Upkeep, trigger this, and Chris Pakula says, all oh, right, that too. Take three, drop down to 11, and that's a two-turn clock, Frank. I can do the numbers on that one all by myself. Yep, Chris has bang, to draw bang. a land on the next turn to cause the Stasis Snare to take out the huge flyer on Magnus' side. And even then, Chris has to somehow come back against, well, a Lumbering Falls, here now Collective yeah. Company. Yeah. This is a super tough position to come back from if you're Chris. So he's going to take six, go to five, and then be facing lethal damage between the Reflector Mage and the Lumbering Falls, even if he finds the land here. And he doesn't find the land anyway. He shows him the Stasis Snare, but he couldn't find the mana for it. So Chris Pakula going to drop down to six and one. Magnus Lanto seven and oh, as he continues moving on up the leaderboards here. But Pakula, you know, he can take a loss here and still work his way through and put himself in a good position for top eight if he can win out. And the game was definitely close. He got Magnus down to four life. Mm. So if the, the turns had gone a little differently, Chris would have easily have been able to, uh, to win this one. For sure. But hey, that was a good game. All right, so let's jump to turbo match here where we've got Oliver Polak Rutman versus John Stern. All right, so Oliver Pollock Rotman, once we uh, go to that table, I know is playing the exact same deck as Magnus Lento. They're on the same team. They all discussed uh, the, the decks uh, before the, uh, the event. And they all agreed on playing this uh, band company with these sweet new additions. As we saw, the Sky Spawner instead of uh, Bounding Crazes. And Oliver told me. Uh, when I ran into him uh, a couple rounds ago, that he hadn't really missed the, the bounding crisis uh, so far. And he was happy with these uh, new additions. So looking through the deck list, what is John Stern on? John Stern is on the green white tokens deck. Pretty much a similar list as the deck that uh, Steve Rubin used uh, to win the Pro Tour last weekend. Except I see four copies of Lamphold Pacifist in the main deck. Oh, four in the main? Yep. I mean, that card has gone up in value the more and more I see it. Mm. When you think of it, a 4-4 four, four for two mana, that's pretty good. I mean, if that's what it was... <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, it's I'm not too too I, far off from it. I'll give you that. I am talking best case scenario here, Fair. but no, it is. Uh, I, I agree. It, at, at worst, it's a great blocker. Yeah, we'll, we'll actually get a chance to hear from uh, uh, from uh, from Steve directly about it. I did a uh, hmm. deck tech with him, and, and I asked him about that card. And yeah, he agreed. I, I I agree. He's got a couple in his main deck. Four here for John Stern, but a card's been going up for me too. So in this game here, we're just in the, the early turns. Both players trying to get on board, getting the, the better presence to be able to set up reasonable attacks. Now this Lampel Pacifist, hey, he's holding all these two trees at bay. Yeah. It's not a 4-4 yet, but well, still does a lot of work. Well, cancel that order, but we can't blame it on Lampel Pacifist, can we? <laughs> no, this is just a Reflector Mage. Yeah, doing what Reflector Mage does. Yep. That is indeed a waste on uh, Oliver's side of the board. A basic land that you can get with Evolving Wilds to activate Aldrazi Displacer. It makes the mana base a bit tough to, uh, to manage, but uh, it still works. All right, Oliver ha is having none of it, though. He's just going to attack with everything. Assuming that Nissa here, 
I would presume all of them are pointed at Nissa. John's turn is still at a high enough life total, although this is a turbo match, so we don't have the exact life totals, but it is still super high, and in such a situation, you just want to get the Planeswalker um, out of the table. Mm. In the early turns, you're always fighting for board presence. All right, looks like only one of the tokens died and the Nissa is still on the table, which meant that wow. Ol Oliver might have gone for the life total after all. Okay. That is a play that can be reasonable if you have some other ways of uh, dealing damage or perhaps an Archangel Evacin that can attack in the air, or if you expect that uh, John's turn has another Nissa in hand, in that case you don't really want to pressure Planeswalkers because John's turn just has another one. Oliver's from Austria, came over. Saw him at the Pro Tour. Looks like he made the trip overseas here. And there we go, Archangel Avison from Stern. Collected company in hand for Ol Oliver Polak rotman He can fire it off if he wants, but he sees no reason to, as this is John's main phase. Yeah, it's a bit unusual to see a main phase Archangel Everson. Yeah, very weird. But the reason why John does it is that he wants to get an additional counter on Archangel Everson from Nissa. He's also considering playing a hanger back for zero here. Ah, in order to uh, possibly transform Everson. Yeah, he did it. That could be sweet, especially given that Oliver has three, uh, three toughness creatures on the battlefield that would all die to the Archangel Everson trigger. Whoop. Wow, right in time, too. Even getting the Sylvan Advocate right before land number six comes down for Polak Rotman. Pretty gross. <laughs> yeah, this is such a powerful interaction. God, well, well worth sacrificing a Hangaback Walker in hand. God, no kidding. Discard a card. <laughs> Wipe your opponent's board. Make a, you know, upgrade your 5-5 five five to a whatever seven power flyer. It's just crazy. Yeah, and Oliver <laughs> cleverly did not cast Collected Company at the end of uh, John's turn there. He smart. would have just hit a couple of creatures that would die to the uh, Everson, the pure fire trigger anyway. Now, if he would have hit a Reflector Mage, could have bought himself some, some value there, but it's too risky, right? Yeah, he already had two Reflector Mages, yeah. so the probability of hitting at least one Reflector Mage in the top six cards is kind of small. I don't know if that's exactly what Oliver wanted, but he's got a Jace and a Tireless Tracker here. A Tireless Tracker in the right matchup looks amazing, and in the wrong one, it looks really slow. Yeah, at this point, what Oliver really needs is some answer to the, uh, to the huge Everson that is coming his way. I'm Tireless. assuming it's just going to kill him pretty soon. Yeah. Ooh, oh, there we go. Evolving Wilds. Wilds. That's interesting. That that gets two clues. It's a bunch of cards. Mm -hmm. Possibly Oliver can use those cards to find an answer. But at this point, racing the Everson the Purifier seems tough, especially against an active Nissa. So Oliver probably has to find some permanent way to deal with uh, Everson the Purifier. And Everson of his own would work, because then Oliver can... Uh, cast Evacyn, give his creatures indestructible, and then block Evacyn the Purifier with his own Evacyn and Eldrazi uh, Sky Spawner. That is just enough power to get Evacyn the Purifier with the counter on it down. That would work, except John has uh, Nissa on the battlefield, which could put another counter on there Pre -combat. in order to uh, oh. keep his creature around. Maybe if uh, Oliver finds two Eldrazi Displacers, is it too late for that? We don't know the life total, so <laughs> I can't answer that question directly. That could work. Oliver does have access to colorless mana in the form of Yavamaya Coast and Wastes. So he could blink twice a turn. Well, it looks like John Stern had another copy of Avis and decided just to play that with those attacks going on, and that did it. John Stern picks up game number one. Yeah, yeah if Oliver was too low at a life total, then that will do it. It's always nice to see Everson, uh, well, at least uh, the front side, Archangel Everson, on the same board as Everson the Purifier. They are different names, so the legendary rule does not apply. You can just happily attack with both.
When I was talking to uh, Oliver on this uh, matchup, they felt that Band Company was still slightly favored, um, you know, between uh, Reflector Mage and um, well other tempo cards. The Band Company deck does have the tools to pressure the Planeswalkers and then take over in the late game with powerful creatures and card advantage cards. But it's certainly close. And when John Stern can uh, do all of these uh, Everson tricks unopposed, that will win the game. There he is again. You know this Lampold Pacifist? It's perfect for this matchup. So many no kidding. Two, two trees in the band company deck. Yeah, it, seriously. It gives so much time. And now even if uh, Oliver just misses a drop, bam, there's a 4-4. A four four, no drawback at all. Wow, yeah. And that happened here. Goodness. And even if uh, Oliver would have had a tree drop here uh, and the uh, Lampold Pacifist would have stayed as a tree tree, John Stern could always just say, cast Nissa, give it another counter, and then it can always attack because it, it looks at itself, sure. seeing a four power creature in that case. Not, not what we have here, but just to illustrate the, the power of Lampold Pacifist in a deck like this. It's worthy of main deck inclusion. There's another one. John decided not to attack. What do you make well, of that? I reckon he was expecting a bounding crisis and didn't want to trade his 4-4 uh, four four unfavorably for a 3-3 three three in, a, in a double block. Now, the fact that Oliver didn't... Sorry, he's collected company in here? All right, fair enough. <laughs> the value team is on the table. Now, Jace and Tireless Dracker. Th does it say anything to Stern, though, the fact that, that Oliver did not play a Bounding Crisis? So John says, attacks. Oliver says, sure. John says, eh, go. And then Oliver just draws his card for the turn. Does that mean that he doesn't have it? Almost certainly, yes. Okay. If you have a Bounding Crisis at that point, which, to be fair, Oliver's deck doesn't actually play, but John doesn't know that. John is considering uh, it. Yeah. You... Um, you just play it when you have the mana on turn three. Yeah. You need to uh, establish your board presence one way or another. Okay. Just interesting to put ourselves into John Stern's seat and try to mm. sort out what might be going through his mind. In the meantime, though, Oliver played his land for the turn, played Collected Company, hit Jason Tireless Tracker before passing the turn back. This just looks like the fairest deck in the history of Standard, right? <laughs> it's a bunch of just two mana green creatures. <laughs> yep. There's just nothing broken going on for Stern, but somehow he seems to be ahead on board at least a bit. Mono pacifist aggro. <laughs> there, 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 there's just something <laughs> wrong with the name here. Oh, uh, that's great. <laughs> but yeah, at this point, Oliver better uh, do his best in order to cast a spell on every turn to make sure that those uh, pacifists don't transform into uh, angry 4-4s. Four now, Oliver does seem to have a handful of spells, so that shouldn't be a problem for the time being. But at the same time, Oliver doesn't really have great attacks. However, if you're in Oliver's uh, seat at this point, you're probably thinking, okay, I'm, I'm just going, gonna go for the long game. You know, I have Tyler's Tracker on the battlefield, Jay's drawing me some cards. If the game goes long, I should be able to win it with those kind of card advantage engines. Uh, so uh, as long as those Lampold pacifists stay, well, pacifistic, is that even a word? Uh, no. Okay, well, I guess you still understand what I mean. I do. <laughs> uh, then I can uh, get those card advantage engines going, and I don't really have to worry too much about my life total. C curious, uh, do you know if Oliver has Declaration in Stone in his deck? I can you know, just when we were just staring down three Lamhold pacifists, I can't <laughs> help but think of it. We already saw a Declaration in Stone take out three creatures with one hit in an earlier feature match today, and it was disgusting. There are two copies of Declaration in Stone in the sideboard, indeed. Okay. They're fine in this matchup. They're also an answer to uh, to Everson, so I wouldn't be surprised if Oliver had boarded them in. Mm. 
So now there are some 4-4s. Four can Oliver play two cards in one turn to uh, you switch know, them back? I think he may have actually attacked here. Is that what we're seeing? Yeah. I think that I think that he attacked with his because now he's got six lands. With the the Sylvan Advocate, I think it got triple blocked, and then Avison's coming down. I see, did I see that right? Yeah, that seemed to be the case here. A bold attack by Oliver. He may have been semi bluffing Archangel Avison with that attack. At the same time, he also would have had to expect an Avison from uh, from John Stern. So well, it, 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 John it Stern doesn't delivered seem like it. a great attack to be making there. All right, there's an interesting one, Frank. He's got Evolutionary Leap on the battlefield now as well. Importantly, this allows John Stern to uh, transform Avacyn at will, or at least uh, yeah. get, get the trigger for the next upkeep. It's a big deal. Yeah, he just goes for it here, right? Against Oliver's current board, so many tree toughness creatures. Oh my Seems worth it. Even a Jace that you can take down with, uh, with the damage. Is this happening? So want. Really? You're going to lose four creatures here? And the Jace. Oh, boy. And then there's Archangel Evason. Oh, In to response. save his? Yep. Oh, man. The true one-sided sweep. I guess he must have not killed Jace and decided just to go to Oliver Yeah, that with point, that three damage. At this point, that seems fair. Oliver kind of needs tragic arrogance. No, nope, he doesn't have it. All and right. And that will do it. It's John's turn. <laughs> Oh, what is this? Are we bringing in some... Uh, oh, very nice. It looks like we've got uh, a little bit... Uh, a game three here in round seven. So this one's live. I know we're kind of bouncing back and forth, but one of the things that we can do here is while we're showing you the turbo match, if there's a, a handy game three, we can move them over from our text table under the cameras here and bring you game three live. So here we are. Man, oh. that was disgusting, by the way, Frank. The like <laughs> the blow up your board. I play it. I mean, and you get to keep both of them, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you get a, the purifier and Archangel Avison sitting. There. I mean, what? Absolutely perfect. <laughs> God, this oh. is uh, the dream situation for uh, for using Avison. Oh. Now in this game, uh, looks to be a mirror match of green white versus uh, green white. Mm. Brian Brandon certainly has the advantage here. My he has goodness, yes. A ton of creatures on the board. Even a lowly uh, plant token is currently 2 3, thanks to a counter from Nissa and wow. an emblem from Gideon. Now, there, there's still this 4 uh, this 4 on the other side of the board. So, BBD may not have great attacks. Well, maybe not with the plant tokens, but all of his other creatures can reasonably rumble in there. We are another emblem, so now all the plant. This is getting slightly out of hand here. Uh, looks like BBD is ahead on every metric. <laughs> Planeswalkers, yeah, yeah. emblems, creatures. These plants are four lands. Five. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't want to see such a, such a beast in my garden. No kidding. And yeah, what can can Gary even survive here? <laughs> so he <laughs> let, let's see. Well, he, he, he would he like to double block some <laughs> creature in order to at least take it down. So let's suppose he double blocks... Those knights are 6-6s, six right? Yes, that, that is correct. <laughs> so suppose he double blocks a knight, then there is still 6 plus 4 plus 4 plus Sylvan Advocate is humongous. That is an 8-power creature. That's actually lethal, so he can't, even, he can't even double block. He needs to go jump, jump. And then fall to uh, a <laughs> super low life total. Yeah, I, I, I would be really, really surprised if Gary Wong finds a way to get out of this situation. Yeah, especially with three mana, right? If, if he had a fourth land, mm -hmm. then we could maybe be hopeful of, you know... Land tragic arrogance. Tragic arrogance, mm -hmm. yeah. And it, as it stands... Ugh, not looking good for Gary Wong here. This is game three as well, so... BBD looks like he's about to go 7 and 0 oh with green white tokens. <laughs> well, that is uh, Unless Gary still pulls good. a miracle here. Wait, there's more? 
Ah. Hollowed moonlight just to make sure that you don't get any thopter tokens. Thopters, uh, whatever. Gary says, <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> man. All you right, got me. you did it. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. So Brian Bronduin ends up winning his ground, uh, round seven match, excuse me, uh, over Gary Wong, improving 2 7 and 0. Oh, and that's going to do it for round seven here from Toronto. Ultra Pro is the place to go for all your magic accessories. With card sleeves, deck boxes, playmats, and portfolios showing off the best magic art, Ultra Pro is the standard and safe storage. Visit ultrapro.com for more information. Put your game to the test at a Grand Prix. These magic celebrations are headlined by two-day open tournaments with the best players in your region as well as top magic pros from around the world. Upcoming Grand Prix include New York, Los Angeles, Charlotte, Manchester, and Minneapolis. Visit magic.wizards.com slash Grand Prix for more information. Hello there. Welcome back to the booth here at Grand Prix Toronto. That's Frank Carson. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe. We saw some really powerful stuff that round, Frank. Oh, yeah. We saw the power of Archangel Evan.